Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Davis and you're watching season three of Conversations in Pop Culture brought to you by my sponsors, Mixum Printing, the smarter way to print. I know printing your creative project can be confusing and stressful, but Mixum is here to make it easy from their instant quote calculator that lets you get as many quotes as you want for free to their 24 hour customer service support. Mixum is here to make sure your printing experience runs smoothly from start to finish. And right now you can choose from a range of premium printing options and materials and the company has also printed so many successful Kickstarter campaigns, a bunch of them you even heard about on this very show. And they currently offer services in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK, and they can print and reach your audience anywhere in the world. So if you're ready to print smarter, not harder, head over to Mixon.com. And right now, listeners of my show can drop my name, Andrew Davis, in the message tab of a current order to get a 5% discount on their first order. That's M-I-X-A-N.com. Again, it's at my name, Andrew Davis, in the message tab of your current order to receive a 5% discount on your first order. So please use them, guys. I need the sponsorship. And then furthermore, BCW Supplies is also a, is also a sponsor. And you can drop Pop Anime Comics to get 10% off your entire order because bags and boards are expensive. And my Kickstarter is live, too. But I don't want to talk about my Kickstarter because we're going to be talking about Larry Welch's Kickstarter because I have him and you are a legend here. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, Mixum, that, that's uh, uh, that's who's doing our books. Yeah, I like Mixum a lot, and uh, they're making this show happen, at least pre-Kickstarter, and then I'm hoping that I keep them and keep them happy for the rest that I'm on, you know, doing my show and everything, because they don't torture me as a sponsor, and I love it. So, obviously, mm -hmm. though, you got a lot going on with this Kickstarter involving the cherry action figure, and mm -hmm. that is beyond funded and we're gonna go through it. I got a bunch of pictures. Apparently I found a bunch of favorite new artists that I have because of your Kickstarter. But I do wanna catch everybody up on what is Cherry for those that don't know. So they're not a little bit shocked when they discover it. Ah, okay. <laughs> so so, so what, what is like the brief definition of Cherry for those who don't know? The brief definition of Cherry. Um... <laughs> um, it's a, uh, well, it's a underground comic that I came up with, uh, in the, uh, well, in the seventies actually. And when the underground, uh, scene and, uh, the San Francisco Bay area was going strong and, uh, it just seemed like an obvious thing to, to happen of a, and, Archie style at that, that, that time, uh, um, Archie, there were well, every comic company had some kind of a wacky teenager comics to comic book. Right. And, uh, you know, Marvel had Millie, the model, and there was Binky and the scooter and, and shit like that. So as you know, satirizing the whole, but, but I, I was thinking, well, what if, uh, they did it like real teenagers at that time, you know, or which, you know, took a lot of drugs and got drunk and uh, go out and wreck daddy's car and uh, <laughs> and uh, and have a lot of sex, right? And uh, so then that, uh, that seemed like a funny thing to me, you know, that Archie had been uh, chasing these girls for 50 years, right? And still hadn't gotten any and they just thought that was, thought it was a funny deal. And uh, so I uh, came up with, well, the deal was, uh, I did it as a one-off it was just thinking it was just a you know a concept and it was more like uh i well i have this idea for a comic that would go something like this it took me years of like six years to put the damn thing together you know but uh and uh because obviously it's not archie it's an underground book cherry is a promiscuous 18 year old having a lot of fun and not just with the boys, but somewhat with the girls too. Her mom's the same way. And I love Cherry. And I love everything about it. I love the idea of what it's pushing and the lines, the fact that it's underground. It's making fun of Archie. They didn't win that war with you either. They lost that war pretty hard in a lot of ways. And so what was this like really putting something out that was underground, that was adult, and that really was the first like adult erotica comic and sort of the groundwork in a lot of ways for bad girl art. Right. Yeah, yeah, actually it was. And, and at the time, uh, there was a lot of, uh, well, it was kind of, well, 
S. Clay Wilson sort of uh, paved the way for it. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like he opened the door for us. I like say he showed us that the door was open, that we could do anything we wanted, and uh, and so there was a lot of other stuff going on. I remember, there was a, a Phoebe Zeitgeist in the the National Lampoon. I think uh, that was really well done and everything, but it was, it was, it was her just being fucked by various monsters and things like that. She was a punch board. I mean, oh, that's cool. And, and Wilson was, his stuff was great and all that, but it was just uh, so uh, nasty and violent and stuff like that, which is, you know, it's fine. That's fine. But I thought, I was thinking, well, what about, what about a comic where, where sex was okay and it was fun and it was nice? And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I did that, and that, that was the gag, and then uh, when it turned out that it actually sold and I had to do more, I got beyond, I was just doing like the, uh, the, the cliche things uh, uh, at first, but just, you know, but to go ahead and, and have them be, you know, uh, whatever, hardcore, you know, explicit, you know, actual, you know, penetration, you know. The, uh, you know, they're, they're fucking the teacher and, uh, or the, the guy with the, with the hot car, you know, it takes her out to the boonies and it's fuck her walk, you know, it's, it's, you know, urban legend kind of thing. And, uh, once I got through with those, then, uh, then I had to get in there. Well, let's see when it got topical was, uh, what, one year when, uh, everything was, uh, uh, oh, what was it? Was it Dan, Dan, uh, whatever the thing with the. Oh, oh, all this, all the sex scandals and shit, whatever everything, or all that happened. Oh, yeah, this looks like her. But uh, uh, yeah, so again, political thing, and but just to, it being, uh, yeah, this sort of a, a, a disguise. It's disguised as a sex comic. It looks like a teen sex comic, but it's actually uh, uh, anti-fascist propaganda. Chris, but, Chris, and, Chris, and the gag Chris. of it being, a, and uh, but it's <laughs> what's funny is that the, uh, when they do this, uh, they came up with uh, this TV show, the, the Riverdale thing, <laughs> that really cracked me up. That what the first scene have Archie fucking Miss Grundy in her Volkswagen? What? Wait, what? That's nastier than what I was doing. And so they, it's, it's like they ruined it for me. <laughs> now, now my stuff is not dangerous. It's just some other shit, you know. Well, but at the time, especially in the seventies and even in the eighties, you know, obviously we had the underground comics movement on. I've had Howard Cruz before he passed on, passed away. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace. Dennis Kitchen has been on. And Trina Robbins has been on my shows. And so oh. one of these things that that's very interesting is that at the time in the eighties and even in the nineties. You know, all this stuff wasn't really allowed per se. And now Cherry is relatively tame, I think. And right. so what was that like? Because I don't think without people like you and Dennis Kitchen and Trina and Howard Cruz that in the comic realm, we would have any of this. And it looks like going backwards. And, and, and obviously, this is the first issue of Cherry and what it looks like. You know, at the time, clearly, you know, that was, you know, risque. And now that's tame and even what like Riverdale did. And, you know, I watch a bunch of anime and some of the stuff in there, I'm just like, how the hell did this get on TV? You know, yeah, so, right. but what is that like for you? Because in a lot of ways, you know, I'm very much a free speech advocate in comics and things like that. And right. This has paved the path because without Cherry and without a bunch of other books, this wouldn't happen. And we wouldn't be where we are in literature <laughs> in a lot of ways. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well, that was that at the time uh, that was the irony of it was that this, uh, especially me making it, you know, cute and uh, nice and fun sex. Oh, this is dangerous. It was considered dangerous, right? When the the uh, Mies Commission report on the when it was pornography and everything, when it was a huge deal, and that just amused the fuck out of me. <laughs> that, uh, what? Oh, oh, this this stuff. This is dangerous. Well, okay, here's some more then, but then now it's uh, <laughs> now now it isn't, and so now I have to uh, whatever. Well, do it to my uh, best to fight fascism and uh, creeping uh, neoliberal capitalism and shit like that. As feel as a cartoonist, I feel it's my sacred duty to you know mock authority and to uh, to 
bring the powers that be down to the same extent that they can. My humble offering in in the revolution. I that was you know that was the idea. I was drawing comics for the revolution, which we had started. It was exciting. You know, we were part of something. We were going to change the world, and then capitalism came and sub you know absorbed it all. You know, the next thing we're, we're buying bell bottom velvet bell bottoms at, at fucking Macy's. You know, wait a minute, that's not the idea. It's, so uh, you know, but as I, I'm still doing comics for the revolution. That never happened. Well, 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 well I, 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 I enjoy, enjoy it. The revolution. The revolution. So, so that's what? I, I'm I, enjoying. I don't know why. Why my? Hold up. Let me see what, what's going on. Am I good now? Or not good. Can you hear me? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know why my my phone is being difficult now, and uh, my my laptop's being difficult. Oh, uh, did, did the echo stop? Uh, I I got no echo. Okay, then, then we're good. Sorry about that. So, so as I was saying, I enjoyed the revolution, and I enjoyed pushing the line. And obviously, you've been doing this for almost fifty years. And in that time period, I mean, you've had you know some story work done by Neil Gaiman. You've obviously had a bunch of reprints, and you've had a bunch of other things happen. And obviously, you know, Frankie Comics just did a book of yours. And it's up here, and this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so, what is that like? Before we really dive into the action figure stuff, because that's what I really want to talk about. But obviously, Cherry has been around for fifty years plus at this point, and clearly, people love it. And there's a whole bunch of generations where I'm 29, so I wasn't at the birth of Cherry, but I came into it because I like bad girl art, I like art that's funny, I like things that are. Funny, and then you rearch it, and you get bored with it being tame. And what is this like for you? Because legitimately, you have had probably the most amazing run with a comic uh, from the underground world ever. Uh, yeah, well, that's uh, that actually interested me that uh, that you even that you even know about it because uh, the whole it is not distributed widely anymore like it was. You know, they were. Uh, uh, you know, when it was going, they were printing what ten thousand at a time, and then we reprint them again, and another ten thousand. And now nobody prints them that many, and uh, so I don't even know how it even gets out there. How guys like you even find out about me? It happens because I love weird comics, and I get into my favorite comic company is Zenoscope. And then what happens is that you go, and then Zenoscope goes and hires Dean Yeagle, for instance, and Dean does Mandy. And then Mandy becomes a gateway drug because he did a cover for Xenoscope. And then, then you're like, oh, man, I love Mandy. Why not? What else is like Mandy? Then you discover Cherry. And then you start speaking to people like J.S. Moore and Jim Noble, who's on my show, who's done okay. some stuff for, for Cherry. And then all of a sudden I get really into it. And I'm like, oh, man, I just want to read this stuff. And then I realize I can't afford the like first issues. And then I'm upset for like a week. And then but but I can read it digitally. And I could get up a beat up copy and then you go look at Frankie comics and then they have a variant of a reprint. And, you know, all of a sudden that's how I get in because I'm like, man, there's gateways into all of this stuff from other companies in the most weird way. And the water flows downward. I don't know if that makes any sense, but for me, I'm like, man, I know who Larry Welch is and you've been on my list for six months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So that, that's kind of how I got into it. And then obviously, you know, Cherry's older than me at this point. And it, it, it's very cool for me as a consumer, somebody who loves history and loves underground stuff and underground comics. And that's what I think is starting to happen is that also I'm an indie guy right now and I'm a big Kickstarter guy. And this just has that vibe to it where it's like we're breaking rules by reading this is the vibe. Right. Yeah, well, that's right. That's the, the the first requirement is to break some rules. You know, uh, be, yeah, there, be, yeah. Like, as I say, you know, the, to be considered dangerous, and then you know, the real art to be dangerous. I think you know, to really be art, and you know, really to upset your perceptions and disturb you or something like that. But uh, but uh, yeah, so it's you know. Again, that it's against the rules. Yeah, that was you know being as smart ass. Yeah, and I got it all from, uh, uh, of course, from uh, Harvey Kurtzman. 
and Bill Elder and, and all those guys, the Mad Comics, which were uh, being, when I was a kid in the 50s, uh, the comics were being reprinted in uh, digest form, little pocket books. And I discovered those on the spinner rack next to the comics and, uh, you know, in black and white, small, you know, which is how the undergrounds first happened. But anyway, yeah, uh, reading that and, and that just, and just, that really resonated with me, all of Kurtzman's whole thing. And I didn't even realize it was him. You know, I saw in Mad Magazine uh, that he was, uh, oh, the editor, it was hard because I didn't know what an editor was in those days, you know. But, uh, but that the whole deal, the, the irony and satire and thing, and that the authority was to be mocked. And I got that from, from them. And that, that uh, I'm just you know, continuing on the proud tradition of being a smart ass. And, and I love it because cause I'm a smart ass and it gets me in more trouble than not. And it's amazing yeah. I still have sponsors on my show. So God help me. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. But, 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 but I digress right there. And I'm sure I could talk about Cherry and go through every single issue. And I've read enough of it, not every issue, but I appreciate certain aspects. I appreciate the fact that Archie tried to sue you and they failed miserably. I think that is the funniest thing. On they didn't the they try. They just, they just sort of threatened and everything like that. They sort of, they had to say something. So in case they would actually do it later on, they would say, well, we tried to or something like that. Yeah. To, uh, but yeah, that was yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm proud of that. It's not, as bad. <laughs> it's not as bad as my friend got blocked by Ken Pander. So that's a whole different discussion. And uh, my friend trolled the living shit out of Ken Pander's um, and then he and who? Oh, oh, oh! You froze up on me. Oh, am I here still? Nope. Oh, there you go. Am I here? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A friend uh, trolled Ken Panders because he took all the Sonic the Hedgehog characters from like the first whole first half of the Archie world um, from, from Archie, and <laughs> he trolled him, and uh, him and all of his wrestling friends and co tag team partners basically got blocked by Ken Panders. So if you don't get blocked by Ken Panders, you're in good shape. Is all I'm gonna say at that point. Okay. <laughs> But, but, but I, I digress right there, and I'm sure I could talk about Cherry with you for the next 15 minutes to an hour, but I do want to talk about the action figure stuff because that's what is super interesting right now. I think okay. with you, you obviously have a Kickstarter. It's like almost 14,000 plus at this point, I think. And what prompted this to happen? Because Cherry never got an action figure. Cherry's been around for 50 years. It's multi-generational. And... There's four basic action figures, and then there's a whole subsequential other action figures. And I have pictures, everybody, so bear with. Um, but what prompted this idea? Because this is cool now, and <laughs> this is exciting. And 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 it's it's. I mean, I, I sort of want one. I'm gonna, I'm debating, and I'm tossing and turning and throwing it up. If I'm have, you know, figuring out my finances, but it, they look awesome. You know, well, it's, it's all new to me. This is all new and strange and stuff. This is a whole uh, thing, a whole weird, I guess it's a whole subculture or something that I was re oh, I was reading about, about NFTs or something that it had to do with this kind of collector thing. And this isn't exactly that, but I guess it sort of has to do with that. But the deal is now... Uh, I'm, I feel like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing comics anymore. I'm doing collector's items, which is a whole nother thing. So, and that's the way comics are now. Now they're this precious thing, you know, it's an investment, you know, and you slab them and board them and stuff like that. And that, all that just offenses the crap out of me. But uh, it's uh, and like, well, they uh, mix them who's doing their books for it. And it's great. They're doing a nice job and everything. But I, what I wanted, especially when we uh, redid the uh, the first one, which was a real treat to be able to get to do that. And anyway, uh, uh, I want to do it on newsprint, you know, like it was done before. And you can't even do it that way now. Now it's so now it's, a, it's hard, slick of paper and uh, stuff like that. I ain't got it the cheap as I could, but it's uh, it's sort of like you know, with, uh, oh, there's this uh, guy in, uh, um, where is it, in uh, South Carolina that, uh, the, oh, that had a band, who is a, a comic, or a record store. 
and uh, it does comics too, uh, sells comics too. But he had a, a, a punk band, uh, uh, Sloth, Thing Sloth, right? And I did the album cover art for him. And uh, he did an actual uh, LP, a disc, a vinyl disc. And, get, and it's like three times as thick as the regular records were that we were. Vinyl records, they were like floppy and everything. Oh, no. But now, now it's artisanal, right? So it's thick and it's thick. It's like, it's like letterpress printing. Uh, when they it used to be that uh, printers would take very great care to have just enough pressure on it to put the ink on it, but where you couldn't see the impression. But now they, it's artisanal, and so they crank it up so you can see it pushed into the paper. Say so, yes, this is letterpress. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all different now, which is you know it's okay, I guess, because I'm doing little small runs of books and everything, and, and they're going for ten bucks a pop, which is insane. I mean, I felt bad, but when they were when they went up to from twenty five cents to fifty cents, well, that's too much to pay for a comic book, huh? But you know, we're in a whole other world now. This is in the future. This is the big, bright, beautiful tomorrow that Disney was singing about. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And, and one of the things that I think is very cool about all this is that obviously, you know, it's also now that you, in a lot of ways, control the supply, and that you only do it through a toy manufacturer. You can do it very much on an indie level and an underground level of all of these action figures. And it's also more of an art piece. And there's also a lot more quality control. And also, since you know, you're not technically like Hasbro, you don't have to follow the same protocols of you know having choking parts because it is more art and things of that nature. And what is that like? Because you're able to deliver a better quality product at this point with what you're doing with these action figures to what people want is collectibles or even even taking away the resellability component of it. And that's the space I play in with comic books, pop funkos, baseball cards, trading cards. The idea is that people wanna buy this stuff and just sort of put it on their desk and look at it in a lot of ways and view it as art and view it in their action figure collection. And so what is that like? Cause you're fulfilling a niche and a niche and people want this stuff. And it's not just somebody who was reading it 50 years ago wants it. There's people like me that want it. There's people who maybe not younger than me, but maybe somebody who is five years older than me wants it. And maybe even somebody five years younger than me wants it at this point. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to help you sell a bunch of action figures and people see this interview and are seeing it right now. Right. Oh yeah. Well, it, it <laughs> amuses me, but that's the whole, it's come out of the whole collector's thing. It, it is a collector's item. So the, the, the backing card and, and the little blister pack and everything that that is part of the piece. They're not even really action figures, you know, they're not articulated. They don't, you know, yeah, and you don't play with them, but it's like with the collectors with their toys. And everything. I have what I have a, an April O'Neill uh, one that's in, you know, of course, those, if you take it out of the package, then suddenly it's worth less. And so this is, <laughs> this is great, where the packaging is part of the piece. So it's sort of ironic, it's sort of a satire of itself, a parody of the whole of the whole action figure uh, thing, the whole toy market thing. So that's what I like about it. I mean, I, I love it and I'm gonna just start showing some of the stuff off. So obviously, uh, you know, these are the four that I guess are what I like to call the base where obviously you have the nude, you have her in a bikini, you have her in a schoolgirl. I'm not too sure if panties are optional in that one and you have a red glow and so, these are sort of, I guess, what is sort of just the base set, not the variants, oh, nothing fancy about it, you know, and they're not super limited as the other ones I'm going to show in a second here. So what was it like just even building out these four? Because I think people would have been thrilled with these four, let alone the rest that you've released. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, it's, <laughs> it's great. I, I love it. Yeah. I like uh, seeing my stuff. Uh, come out and take this form. This is a whole different uh, form. That's great. And, and, and then I would also show the plush fol folia or whatever that are philia, but I really don't want to get taken off YouTube or Facebook because that one is completely nude. And the background for that, you know, I, I think I'm pushing the line far enough with some of these already. Um, but even having that also being offered and out there and really delivering because that is what cherry is in right. so many ways 
and it's great. And what is that like to have a fifth one in there and also have that set? Because obviously people want this. People who come to Cherry, you know what you're getting into. And those four, you know exactly what you're getting with Cherry. And so what is that like to really deliver that in more with that fifth one that I can't show? <laughs> That's great. That is, uh, yeah, so it's no longer the thing of like uh, like the first cherries that I did, or even still kind of, uh, and I was, at the time I was doing that, I was uh, hanging out with uh, Dan O'Neill and the Air Pirates in uh, San Francisco, and sort of the idea of that, of them doing the Disney stuff, was that you could slip it onto the spinner rack, and you wouldn't know the difference. And so, you know. Who, who are you hanging out with? Dan O'Neill and the Air Pirates. You know the Air Pirates when they did the whole, oh, they did the whole uh, thing with them do, taking the Disney characters, the old ones though. He figured that they they were in public domain at this point, you know, because they're old and uh, uh, and having them do nasty stuff, you know, doing you know, and uh, you know Bobby London who was do, did uh, Popeye for a while after that, and uh, Gary Hallgren and uh, Ted Richards and uh, Sherry Flanagan. Uh, we're doing it, and uh, uh, it was very. And and, and do it. Disney end up suing them, and it was a big deal. They sued the shit out of him, and, and he fought them to a standstill, basically, to where he played. They finally said, "Oh, okay, it's okay for you to do that shit, but nobody else can." <laughs> right? Well, well, I'm sure Disney is going to have a fun time with Winnie the Pooh. I am sure because that is open season. Is all I'm going to say on Winnie the Pooh. And uh, <laughs> good luck, Disney, and uh, have a fun time with that because uh, everything that everybody has wanted to do is going to come out in the next six months. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Oh, okay. This <laughs> movie, The Pooh, I think, is public domain now. Oh, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. Like a week ago. Like, <laughs> this isn't even like six months like ago. It's like a week. It's, it's going to be fun. But right. Winnie the Pooh, I mean, hey, you know, I would, I would pay good money for Winnie the Pooh cherry. That's all I'm going to say. I pay decent money for it, you know. I pay good money yeah. for a stretch part of that. Yeah, well, that was one thing that always pissed me off about Disney was that it, the kids growing up and they think think that uh, Winnie the Pooh was a Disney thing, it's a Disney character that, and he did that with all that stuff, you know, with Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and everything like that. No, they're not Disney things. Disney took them and they made it and Disney fight it and 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 Winnie the Pooh especially was to that. That, and that really is identified with Disney, and I uh, resented that all along. <laughs> There's so a lot of now, now he's free. <laughs> he's free. It's open season. Everybody should just go have a good time with it. You know, right. there's something in the honey. Let's just leave it at that. You know, you yeah. put whatever you want at the honey. You know, honey is, is something else. And then I can think of 15 <laughs> acronyms, or I don't know what we call something for something else. But, but obviously, you know, I'm just waiting for somebody to come out with, like, the X-rated Winnie the Pooh. And yeah, right. Yeah, well, he's been running around, around with no pants with this childlike, childish character, you know, out in the woods with no pants on, you know, all the long. Like, what? What is this, Sammy? Come on. I mean, <laughs> I, I want a pants-wearing Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> just give me a pants-wearing Winnie the Pooh, somebody, and I will be thrilled. To, 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 I will be happy as a pig rolling in shit. If you give me a pants wearing Winnie the Pooh, no shirt, no shirt, just the pants. I think I think there, there's a real open market here. There, there is right now zero Winnie the Poohs without pants. And <laughs> the possibilities are endless. But enough talking about Winnie the Pooh. We do need to talk more about Cherry because yeah, right. <laughs> all the variant action figures. And this is some of it out there. Um, but more importantly, this is sort of I think Sam Payne, I want to say, Sam Payne did this, and then Sam Payne did this, and these are super, super limited. And so right. what was this like, bringing in another artist to have a variant edition and have it super limited, have it, you know, where few people can get it, and some of these are already sold out, I know. Oh, uh, that's great. I, uh, yeah, I enjoy having other... Other artists interpret her. It's uh, it's sort of uh, 
what I attribute uh, success to is her iconic nature. She's uh, she isn't really a specific character. It's sort of like sort of like like Betty Boop. You know, it just sort of represents a spirit of something. You know, and most of the people that that really are into Betty Boop don't even realize that she was a comic. That she was a cartoon. You know, with the uh, but and uh, but that kind of thing is. But yeah, so I I enjoy seeing other people interpret her. And then, then I think Sam also did this one as well, where this is the pink one, and I don't think you can get this one anymore. I think this one is completely sold out, and uh, obviously it's a lot of fun. It adds a variation, and it's really cool to me because obviously I come from the comic world. I'm not a big action figure guy, but it's the idea that when you have a variant and then you have a rare variant and then you have super limited things. And then also when somebody says, Hey, I can interpret a character a certain way because I've seen Spider-Man and Batman be interpreted 15 different ways. And it's nice to see that because every once in a while somebody comes up and they have a really, really cool way of doing something. And it's just nice to not see the same shit over and over again. And yeah. What is that like for you? Because I also imagine it inspires you to some degree saying, oh man, I never thought of my character in that light. And it's just really cool to see it done in that style. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's great. And then, and then continuing with that, because this is my new favorite artist. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like that one. <laughs> She's great. She is great. And what's really cool about the background is that that I think was almost graffiti down a wall. That's what's super yeah. cool about that piece is that yeah. that card on, um, you know, you know, like on Maku Fufu, I think, I think that, or Mako Fufu's, you know, Instagram, like you can see her doing it. And it is an awesome, awesome thing that she's done. And so, what is that like to see this piece? Because this is just new school, right out of new school, like this classic, right out of new school. I want to tattoo this on me. All right. What? 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 So that the what that that's on Instagram. I heard doing that on a wall. I, I yeah, understand. yeah. I think she graffitied it on, like spray painted it on on Instagram, like on a wall somewhere. And it's super cool. And like a lot of her art is like that, where it is a very cool piece. Where yeah. Just just like from from just how it was conceptual, because it's got that graffiti feel to it. And like her style is just amazing. Like I am gonna hopefully if she takes covers when I produce a comic, I want a comic cover from her because oh, yeah. she is amazing. Like right. this is this is somebody I had no idea existed until last night. And I'm like, this oh, okay. she, she's got unbelievable talent. And so what is this like for you? Because this is just one of the people you have working on, you know, these acts and these cards and these variants and it's almost like a whole new generation of artists are working on cherry and oh, yeah. characters to a new light and it's it's so amazing oh yeah it is it's great it is yeah it's like that it, uh yeah it warms my heart that uh, it's a whole new generation of uh, that, uh, that it's like like i was asking him you though like how do they even know about me i mean that's uh that's uh but i'm flattered and honored and uh stuff yeah i've seen before uh, uh she showed up on on walls and graffiti a uh, place in oh and and dallas uh where somebody did a wall piece of her that was years ago anyway um yeah no i, I love it i love it that was just great and then then even even continuing with this you know another one that that i didn't know existed is spicy donut and spicy donut obviously it's a spicy play to it very much also similar to new school but you know obviously you know sort of a beach bikini feel and what is this because this is also classic cherry in a lot of ways and this is just yeah. another version of her and this is definitely also something i love right oh yeah yeah that's great and then i'm just going to show a bunch of them because because this is obviously sort of the night version this one i know is straight out of you know <laughs> cherry. this this is gotta be close to your heart in a lot of ways because this is i think Right from the first one, this 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 cover. Uh, yeah, I think so. Huh? Yeah. What what is that? I like? see that one. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> so what is that like to have something going old school as well? 
and you know bringing that back and showing what cherry is as a character and all that stuff because this is so interesting to me as well yeah well it's uh, it is interesting i was thinking well that this is old but it's new stuff for for you guys you know for this new generation it's it's all new to them so uh because because that that's what's so interesting as well is that and obviously you just said it but for me you know, a lot of this stuff is new and, you know, my audience is going to be introduced to Cherry and they're going to be introduced to, you know, your art style and a variety of interpretations and a bunch of, you know, talented people working on it. And, and that's part of why I wanted to interview you as well is that my generation, some people know you, some people don't. And I think what it is, is that it's very cool when they see both the new stuff and the old stuff and they see everything in between. And that, you know, obviously is very cool when you have 50 years of something and something that is iconic because Cherry's been all over. And obviously a bunch of people have worked on this, you know, just, just to go through a few more, obviously, you know, Mermaid mm -hmm. Cherry, which is the Curly Bunny. And that's another person coming <laughs> okay. up. George Weber in space. Weber. Yeah, no, that's good. I like that one. I yeah. love this one too. Yeah. It's great. Um, this one's sold out. So that's cool mm -hmm. and everybody could be upset and uh, you know, <laughs> that's something that, that, that is really perfect. Um, and this is, you know, Savage Cherry and that's also just classic. And this is the one that I'm curious about because, mm -hmm. you know, Peach Momoko is a big time Marvel artist and she's slaying dragons right now. And yeah. she's got an exclusive deal with Marvel. She could do some indie stuff. And this is definitely schoolgirl and what is this like for you because having peach momoko in your project involved i think there's only 20 of these obviously taking that japanese schoolgirl and taking it to the next level in my opinion mm -hmm. and what is that like and also going back you know issue number two cherry pop tart and all that stuff as well what is that like for you as an artist that somebody who is right now very much slaying dragons and has a big deal with marvel is coming into cherry knowing exactly what cherry is and doing what cherry should be and paying a lot of respect to cherry i feel uh, yeah that was that was great actually i was impressed it was, yeah he's, i'd never heard of her before that that was mike at golden apple comics that he uh uh helped us do the uh the, the reprint of number two there and so he came up with with her and uh, uh, and now and wow, she really, really is good, and uh, and she was all uh, really honored to uh, be doing it for me. I was like, wow, really? But yeah, but you're really good. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, yeah, I'm honored uh, that she does that. That and that's uh, I really like that because yeah, the stuff she's doing for Marvel, she's she's really, really good. Because because it, it must be very cool for you because a lot of these people. Obviously, you paved the path for a lot of people in comics, directly, indirectly. And a bunch of these people, I think they would have jobs. I'm not saying you created jobs for them, but I think that that people like you, Dennis Kitchen, Trina Robbins, Howard Cruz, you know, I could throw Denny O'Neill in there, Chuck Dixon to some degree, a variety of other people have really helped to build out the industry in a lot of ways. Paul Levitz as well. Um, and so what is that like that a bunch of young people are now doing things that involve your project because and are happy to and feel, hey, you know, I know exactly who Larry Welts is and the fact that I get to be part of this project and that I get a one on one or there's only 10 of these out there. You know, it really I don't know how you feel about it, because obviously I'm not at that stage. I've never had anything like that happen to me. And I know if it does, I'm going to be very, very humble about it. It's going to be very eye-opening and very interesting. So I'm curious how you feel about it because obviously, you know, it's your legacy in a lot of ways. Yeah, I guess so. But no, I'm uh, uh, whatever. I'm honored and humbled. I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't even like my stuff. I don't think, think I don't think it's all that good. <laughs> That's uh, and so uh, it's really gratifying to me that these get that they're totally getting it, getting the whole idea of, of it, of what I'm trying to say here, you know, which is nothing specific, but it's going to be just, you know, ironic and sarcastic. That's the main deal. But, uh, but yeah, no, I am, I, 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 
What can I say? I don't. Uh, <laughs> I I love it. This is great. And, and then even going further into this, because I do want to create a sense of urgency for people. Um, a bunch of these have sold out. A bunch of them have limited tens. You know, some of them have limited twenties. I know the cowgirl sold out. I know Tim Seeley worked on one of these with you know somebody else and so with with uh, Michael Russell, you know Kurt Michael Russell. And I bought the regular version and the nude version sold out and a variety of others. And then you did a series of eight or 10 of them that had, you know, Helena, you know, and a variety of others, Babysitter Cherry and Sufferette Cher Cherry, Cleopatra Cherry. And those are all gone as well. And so what is that like that all the good ones are gone? Like, seriously, it's like, really? and, and all the super rare ones. And that's not to say there aren't ones that are still available that are great that, you know, Mako Fufu, it looks awesome. I think there's like one or two or three of them left. But what is that like for you that people just jumped on this and people are super excited for it? And they're like, I've been waiting for this. Just take my money. It's, it's strange. It's strange to me because, like I say, I've never heard of this stuff before. This is all new to me, especially this way. You know, I'm an acting There's always been you know, toys and stuff like that, but this isn't toys, this is art pieces. And so, uh, I, yeah, I'm, uh, it's, it's strange. <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is my world. So, 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 you know, I was like, oh man, this is so cool. And when, you know, it came about me and I was asking for money for my Kickstarter and then I'm like, oh, somebody gave me Larry Welch? Sure, why not? This is awesome because he's on my list. And I don't think anybody would ever say yes. And so that's strange to me, but, even still, like I'm looking at this and I'm like, I know exactly what people are thinking with this, where they want to buy it, they want to appreciate, they want it to go up in value. And especially the ones of ones or the tens, you know, the ones that only have 10. I mean, it's becoming a very interesting world and it's a very collectible world at this point. Yep. And it's also fun because unlike an NFT and a friend just granted me an NFT as a gift, um, I can't physically hold an NFT. I could physically look and display an action figure or a piece of art or a comic book. And I think that's also what's happening too, is that people like to look at this stuff and watch it, appreciate it, and also be part of a club. Because if you have a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, nobody else has that. And it's in your possession. And right. you're also owning a piece of history of something that never has been done before with charity. You know, so it's very cool, at least the way I look at it. And I look at the collectible market and maybe it's because I'm slightly of a greedy capitalist and I like to have super exclusive things that nobody else can have. But I don't know how, how, how you're like, just, just even just like being like, oh man, it's still selling out. Like I would be ecstatic and I'd be super stoked. It's all nice. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, well, this is all strange to me. This is new territory. It's, it's completely new. And uh, this is this is the future for me. Yeah, no, and then and, and even going further, because also you're hitting a few other niches. Obviously, there's some cool things, and, and I like this one too right here, which is the skate deck. So that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. That's straight out of the 80s, by the way, yeah. everybody. Yeah. I mean, that is a perfect tier reward, is all I'm going to say, is that, I mean, just look at that. That is a skate deck out of the 80s. The only, <laughs> thing, the only thing that would be cooler is if it was screen pressed, like the Tony Hawk skateboards that were screen pressed, because those things are like bank. So so, so a, a Tony Hawk screen press board is like a $2,000 skateboard. Like the first ones, they're expensive, just the deck. So, But, but I love that artwork on it, I do. And then, and then there's also the, the this right here, which is the pin, the patches, and then in the add-on section is the shirt, which is similar to the skate deck. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of cool stuff. I wish there was just a tier for the shirt. Like, that, that's my only complaint is that I would, I would love a shirt. That's all I want is because that shirt's awesome. <laughs> you know, and I know it will upset people, too. That, that's why I want it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I can upset somebody with a t-shirt, I know it's a good shirt. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Art should be dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Art should be dangerous. 
And, and so obviously there, there's just so much stuff. And then I think I like missed that at least like 10 of, you know, the action figures and the variants you got going on and all sorts of stuff that that's happening. And I think you got maybe a prototype paint today. That I don't think you saw yet. So that's kind of cool that that's going on. And a lot of stuff is happening with this. Um, but I am curious because obviously I am brand new to Kickstarter and my Kickstarter is the fun season three of my podcast and I'm doing all right. I'm 73% funded, which I am beyond pleased with because I thought I would be at 10% funded by this time. Um, and I actually like Kickstarter as a platform because I actually get to know my backers. I actually get to know what they're interested in. I get to know demographics and what is that like for you to be on Kickstarter? Because it is very much the future. It is very much a whole system of funding projects and not having to deal with a middleman and deal with anybody else and also get to see what people really like and what they don't like and who's buying what and where they're buying it from and also not have to play by the authoritarian rules for lack of a better word. Right. Well, like I say, it's all all new to me, and this is uh, very strange. It's not like it was before. You know, I mean, I used to get actual, uh, uh, you know, fan letters, you know, actual paper in the mail, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this is great to being able to uh, fund it from a different place, and, uh, and it's a new way of of doing things of of dealing with the public that I'm not really very good at the thing of engaging people on the time here time and I, I'm you know I just it takes me forever to do a book I'm working on the, the next book and it's just uh, and I can't keep up I can't do it like these kids are doing it and you know, we do an update every week I it takes I can't I'm not that fast I just don't work that way and uh, the whole thing of the, the style of how it's done, the Kickstarter thing is it's it's new to me and I'm not very good at it. And so uh, I'm, I'm not good at it either, but I am learning it and I'm, I'm loving it. And I, I find it so fascinating because it is everything that, that I really want. Minus the trolls who, who are giving me a hard time. There's like two or three people on Facebook who are giving me a hard time almost every other day. Minus that, I find it such an underground and such like an independent you know, way to do business and such a, you know, sort of, I don't want to say counterculture because it's mainstream, but this is sort of, I think my generation, especially in indie comics, their underground movement where all these projects are getting funded. So my friend Larry Higgins has a book called Niobe and that book you got, just got picked up by Antarctic Press, but it took almost eight years for that to happen. And it's the idea, though, that it's a very underground book that's dealing with real issues. It's a real comic book. You know, he had a book that dealt with a pro-life, pro-choice, you know, political debate around protecting a child that a riot broke out essentially in over it. And, you know, the, those characters and two characters are arguing and they're on opposing sides. And I feel like in mainstream that wouldn't have been allowed to happen. And Kickstarter allowed that book to occur. And it's very, very cool. And I feel like it's very much an underground position now. And that's what I really like about your Kickstarter is that this is an underground action figure being funded versus mm -hmm. traditional. And it's very cool. And there's a lot of cool stuff that's being done. I mean, you have variant limited edition backer cards, essentially. And I don't know what we call that with action figures, but who does that ever? Yeah, right. Really. Yeah, well, it's all it's, you know, it's a brave new world. It's, it's, it's things are different now. So. And, and so, I, I mean, I love it and I find this so fascinating and I'm curious and I can't wait to see what you do next, because there's a lot of stuff that I think can be done here with even for the next batch and whatever you got planned and even with Cherry as well. Um, and obviously, I sort of already mentioned the T-shirts and all that stuff. And then also, you're doing something that I appreciate as well, where you have a retail package, you have a Brexit package, which I just think is the best name for it ever. I don't know whose idea it was, but I thought that was pretty funny. Just Brexit for the UK is specifically designed for them. I'm oh, a kid. Oh, 
All right, I haven't seen that. <laughs> so, so there's a tier on the Kickstarter, and I'm in, I'm in you know East Coast, but it says Brexit, specifically designed to ship to the UK, and I just <laughs> I just think it's funny. Um, yeah. On a political joke level, I think it's funny, and I thoroughly enjoy whoever did that tier. Really has a sense of humor. Is <laughs> all I'm going to say. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, but but even going further into this and, and your Kickstarter a little bit. Obviously, you have a little bit of help and a little bit of support with, you know, some people helping you out and building it out. And I don't know exactly how to pronounce their name per se, but what is that like? Who's helping you to produce the action figure and a little bit of the Kickstarter support and all that stuff? Because this is really, I think, helpful to, to a lot of people and it's helped you a lot as well. And even just having that you know, really good company behind you that really knows how to do this stuff and how it knows how to put out a quality product. Because I think the last thing people want, and this is something I'm trying to stress, is a shitty cherry action figure, which these are not, from my understanding. Right. Yeah, right, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all, uh, yeah, it takes somebody else has to do it because, you know, obviously I, I don't know how this, any of this shit works. So, yeah, it's, uh, Gabriel Discordia, he's uh, he's doing it all. And so that that's something that, you know, the, the way I think it's really said on the website, and it's said mm -hmm. it's not an action, this is a piece of art, where yeah. it's very much a piece of art and you're displaying it that looks like an action figure and that it's something that is very different. I think that's something that people need to understand is that you're not going to be ripping this open. Hopefully, I mean, you can, it's your property. Once you back the game, yeah, exactly. you get it. it's yours. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do. And I don't think Larry is going to tell you what to do with it, but I don't think it's in your best interest to rip it open and then play with it. No, no. Cause the packaging is, that is part of the piece. The whole idea is, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I like that. That's, uh, there's just something strange and weird about that, that, uh, that appeals to me. <laughs> I, I think it's great. I mean, it's it's right up the collector's alley, and it's so perfect. And yeah. you know, even to go further into this, and, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, you know. But I am curious because obviously this is just another element of cherry. And what is that like? Because you've done comics at this point. You've done you know something with Neil Gaiman on more of a deluxe edition story. Um, obviously, you have reprints that Frankie. Comics variant is very cool that somebody else did that cover. I think it's Rose Bashesh, I want to say, or I can't say River Bash. Um, and a variety of other people have reprinted your books as of lately. And then now you're you got t-shirts, album covers, and now you're getting an action figure. What is that like that you really have a whole sleigh of merchandise cutting across multi facets of media? It's it's great. Because, you know, it's uh, very strange. We was always wanting to to do that all along. And uh, when I was with uh, Kitchen Sink for a while, just before they became Tundra, and it was sort of a long story, but they what, oh, there was a... Kenneth told the story. So if you guys want to go see that, you could go watch that entire interview. It's a, gr it's a great interview with Dennis Kitchen, but I know that entire story, and we didn't go too much into it. Oh okay, yeah, right, right. Yeah, well, but anyway, while he was the, doing that, uh, they did a, a, like a cherry beach towel, and uh, what else we do? We we're gonna do. We never got around to doing the uh, the chocolates, which I really wanted to do because it comes with a, a cigar box, you know. <laughs> that never happened, but that uh, dang. But really, you just box. wanted it for yourself. That's what you really yeah, wanted. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I you know, like the idea of it, you know, because it, it's a good. Uh, property it lends itself to that you know to that image the icon being put on various things on skateboards and whatnot so it is it's great i love it yeah and, and, and cherry is just such a great iconic character to put on anything that you want to put it on you know you put it on you know a towel a skateboard you put it on an album cover it gets the job done and everybody knows what who cherry is what cherry does and mm -hmm all that stuff and so obviously you know an action figure makes 100 percent sense and i'm just a little shocked that it hasn't happened sooner to be honest yeah, really. <laughs> yeah well <laughs> i uh yeah i'm just uh just a cartoonist you know i don't know how to do all this 
merchandising and marketing crap, you know, that's, that's sort of, you know, underground or that's sort of, you know, against her uh, thing, you know. <laughs> Well, see, Kickstarter solves that though, because Kickstarter is the un new underground where it's right. not corporatism, or at least Kickstarter doesn't have to be. You know, there, there are right. people who make Kickstarter their business, and that's fine. I am 100% honest where I am not making money on my Kickstarter, but I'm not losing money on what I'm funding. And all the money's going back into developing what I'm trying to do. And it's basically covering expenses, getting my show into podcast form, paying for my streaming. And maybe if there's 50 bucks left, I'll go buy myself a six pack to celebrate. You know, right. that, that that's, that's the whole thing is that I'm not making any money on it. It's going back into it because the way I make my money is through sponsorships and other ways. You know, I don't make my money through the Kickstarter, but the Kickstarter is a way how to really help fund it because sponsorships don't happen sometimes. Um, and so I think Kickstarter with this action figure really is the way to go because you don't have to go and then you're not dealing with a company that has a bottom line the same way that Hasbro or Jack's Toys has a bottom right. line. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole different uh, framework and uh, setup, yeah. yeah. And then also you have a lot more control over it too where you don't right. have to surrender your character. You know, you, you can see my elf is up there you know, that's been my logo for 10 years. I am very, very protective of that logo. Meaning right. that if somebody steals it, I become very litigious very quickly. Um, if somebody makes a certain comment about it and says, I want to go fuck your elf, I get upset because <laughs> that's my logo. If I say my elf is going to have sex with somebody, it's different because it's mine. You know, if you said you want to throw my elf with charity and they were both doing something something i might let it go because it's you but <laughs> the, the idea is that i'm very protective of my property and my intellectual property and i think that with this and this entire and correct me if i'm wrong since it's kickstarter you didn't have to give that up as well and that's very interesting when, when people have to go, go down those paths and make those choices and that's what i think people have to understand too is that all of the action figures that i showed you had really the final say on where you had right. a lot of control on who was invited in, what they could do, what they couldn't do. And w within reason, I mean, you're not going to tell somebody how to draw a line, for instance, but you might not want somebody to be wearing something or you might not like an idea. You know, obviously, I'm uh, just going to throw this one up here because because I like this one. If you didn't like Cherry in Space, it would not have happened, is my point. Right. Yeah, well, that was uh, the whole deal of uh, what we used to call underground comics. A uh, large part of it, uh, the radicalness of it, was the very idea of us owning our own shit. Because that wasn't a thing until then. And that's what I think people need to understand. And it's a very, very good lesson where, you know, I've been speaking to people, you know, who don't own their own brand in certain industries and in certain comics. And I'm like, you can't retweet out my Kickstarter. And like, I can't do it. Your brand is not my business. And that to me is the quintessential of the dumbest decision anybody can ever make in their life. Because when you don't own your brand, you don't own the right to retweet whatever you want to retweet. You right. know? And, and, and you don't own your intellectual property. And why did you develop it if you didn't? own it. And I think that's something that a lot of creators need to learn. And whether you own it by accident or intentional, it doesn't really matter because once you own it, it's yours. Like I own that elf. I own this show. I own my bigger company. You know, it's, right. it's something that I think, and I think I would imagine you feel the same way about charity is that mm -hmm. it's yours. It's not Marvel's, it's not DC's and I don't think you have any intention of selling it to anybody at the moment. Nope. Oh no. And so, no, no, it's 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 a very important thing because because I, I think a lot of creators don't understand that, and they're signing deals with companies, and you know those deals are tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying it's, it's a good lesson where I want to own my shit and I don't yeah. want anybody else to. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Unless you're giving me a million dollars, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. they don't think about it. Yeah. <laughs> a million dollars goes a long way now. Create something better. Somebody wants to buy my show or pieces of my show for five hundred thousand to a million dollars, you know, my line is open for it. <laughs> my, my Twitter DMs are open for that. Ah. For other things, but that's not the point. Um, so if you have a million dollar offer for me, anybody out there, and you want to buy my show. I will entertain the offer. And what right. I mean entertain the offer is buy you a plane ticket and take you out to a nice restaurant as soon as you hand me the check. <laughs> but, but, but I digress. And, and all jokes aside, um, I am curious because this is just the next chapter in Cherry. I know you're working on some book stuff with Cherry, but what can we expect with these action figures? What can we expect with these pieces of art? And what can we expect with Cherry going forward? Because... There's a lot more stuff I got a feeling that's coming out with you in the next few years. And you don't have to spoil anything. You could reveal as much as you want, but what's a little bit of a taste for everybody who's about to learn about Cherry and make it their new favorite comic? Uh, well, I'm working on a, you know, another book. I want, you know, my idea is to do a, a graphic novel, you know, do a big long story that, uh, is uh you know fights fascism in some way and uh everything and and uh as far as anything else uh i don't know like i say it's all new to me and we're just making this shit up as we go so uh who knows <laughs> hey you know as i'm looking forward to it and, and obviously i'm very very excited because i would love a graphic novel of cherry it'd be easier for me to consume it and I would be stoked for it because it's just easiest for, for me to consume that in that format, um, yeah. either visually or physically. And I'll pay whatever because because it's going to be good, hopefully. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we're we're uh, starting to think about anyway putting together an, an omnibus of you know of all this shit that I've done for fifty years. You know, put it all in one book or a set of books. You know? So that's that, also that, that, helpful. Yeah. Because because I think I think people would really be down for that, especially if it's a hardcover book. Right. Oh yeah. People really want hardcover stuff. You know, it's the idea that with Howard Cruz, you know, the hardcover edition of Wendell is a very cool book. It's very exciting. The hardcover issues of Stuck Rubber Baby, you know, that stuff is awesome to have. It looks nice on a shelf. And also, it's the idea that I think people will go ballistic over that stuff if it was Kickstarter in so many ways. Not to mention that I think comic shops would also be interested in possibly having their own variants of books and omnibuses and really nice books because, oh, let's be realistic, people want exclusive material in their stores, and I am an exclusive guy too. You know, I was trying to negotiate a deal with Frankie Comics and uh, they didn't get back to me because uh, I was trying to get myself a few books for, for some ads and uh, the negotiation is still open, everybody. So that's what I'm hoping for because I like the exclusive books. Um, but I do want to back out of the entire cherry thing for a few minutes and I am curious and I ask every guest this, but and I don't know how many conventions you do. I don't know how many conventions you've done in the past, but obviously the last two years, and it looks like the next year, and I, I can't predict the future, is going to be rough as far as cons and going to con conventions and COVID and all that stuff. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, because I'm 29. You are significantly older than me. You have a very different outlook due to wisdom being in the industry for over 50 years at this point. And where do you think everything is shifting and where do you think the next year to two years is going to be with all this stuff going on with that? That's why I don't know. It's, it's strange for me because I'm, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, oh, I've always been a freelance, uh, you know, independent artist. So I have no uh, retirement fund. I got no pension. I got no 401k. I got no nothing to uh, take care of me in my old age, but it's coming anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, and we were uh, all set up to do like six or seven conventions in uh, 2020. 
and uh, they all got canceled. And we do really well at the. At well, what, is, what is it like for you? And the reason why I ask this is that I have only presented at cons, and I've gotten to the stage where I am just tired. Especially my last few panels were rough panels and just professionalism issues and a variety of other stuff. And I've never gotten paid for it. And I'm making money podcasting in my house, which means I don't have to go and you know, spend money to go to a con, stay in a hotel, all that stuff. And right. I kind of don't want to go back. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense where my business isn't predicated on that, but I do miss certain aspects of it where after panels, people want to come and talk to me about a particular topic. And the, that fan interaction is lost but also the money is gained. And I know people make money at cons. I know a variety, there's a variety of ways people make money. And it's tricky because, you know, certain aspects and certain artists and creators, they're predicated in their funds are to, to get new fans or even just to move merch sometimes are on that. So what has that been like? Because clearly there's been damage done in that sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, not to go with two inside to inside baseball and you don't have to disclose funds or anything like that. But I think it's, I think what I said is relatively safe. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, um, yeah, well, we're, um, yeah, we're starting to get back into conventions. We do some of, we did, uh, we did Tampa and we did, uh, um, uh, well, well, I'm getting ready to do one uh, this weekend. There's one in, in Albuquerque here. So it's hometown convention, which is nice, you know, don't have to book a hotel and all that shit. And uh, yeah, so uh, conventions are, are good for me because there's a, <laughs> but there's a very, it's like a really uh, sort of a narrow slice of the public that goes to conventions that is my demographic, you know, but you got to show up there anyway, you know, for, but I, you know, I do panels and, uh, and nobody shows up, you know, or like two guys show up. So it's a very, uh, but you know, you make it up in per se. If you get enough people going by my table, then some of them will be. Although lately has been very gratifying. Like this is so excitement about the action figures and stuff like that. But I've had a lot of uh, young people and women. You know, it really, uh, I really like it that uh, women are, are fans of, of my stuff. There's been a shift where a lot of girls and a lot of women are now really into bad girl art, where that has been a massive shift, you know. Zenoscope, which is obviously they do a lot of bad girl art company and they may or may not like me saying this, um, but they are very variant heavy, very bad girl art heavy. Um, they have a very large female audience. Right. You know, one of uh, the deals when I started out, like I was saying, what the, the, all the other uh, comics were, and when you had sex, it was associated with violence and all this stuff, you know, and rape and shit. And that was one of the deals that that I did uh, was just to uh, have her not be a victim. And I don't, you know, s preach about it and say, oh, look, she's not a victim. No, she just isn't. And uh, people really respond to that. Women really appreciate that. And that's- yeah, I think that, that having something that, that, that is just, it's sex, it's not anything else. It's, it's, it, it, it sounds basic. And that, that's something that, that I think, you know, people, I was just like, this is cool. And I think that, you know, there's been a very much cultural shift where mm -hmm. I know a bunch of girls are like, oh man, that cover is hot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like I know a bunch of them and I'm like, yes. And, and, and it's funny. And, you know, I interview a lot of women creators. I'm reaching out to a bunch and it's just a weird thing where obviously, you know, that's what's going on with that and so i just think it's very interesting and i'm very excited because i kind of like cherry and 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 you know i'm excited for for like all the reprints and all the good stuff and i'm hoping frankie comics does like issue four of cherry because obviously i like all this stuff and you know i i guess i guess I, i'm curious how you think about this is where do you think the future of comics is going because obviously you know your stuff's getting reprinted this action figure thing is doing amazing, which I think is testament to what Cherry is. The fact that the old stuff is still good and it's better than a bunch of the new stuff. And people really, you know, harbor on that. Both people from my generation, possibly younger, and even 
older than me who read Cherry when it first came out want this stuff now. And where do you think all that stuff is going? Because a lot of stuff has changed in the last two years, let alone the last 10. Oh, yeah. The, well, actually, right. Then this is, a, as I say, a new thing. And there's a whole new market that didn't exist before. I mean, I've had uh, several people over the years uh, come up and want to be my uh, licensing agent. Oh yeah, I'll do all this stuff, you know, and, and get all this merchandising happening, and pfft, nothing. And I always tell them going in, you know, that hey, this is not, this is not a Garfield, this is not a Simpsons, this is not a thing you can have the shit at the checkout stand to the kids to grab, you know. And this is not that. This is a whole different thing. And so now there is a market for that, still. And uh, that's it wasn't happening before. I mean, people just fail miserably to you know try to be my agent and. And it just didn't work that the market wasn't there. Yeah, and I think I think the internet has expanded that tremendously in, in so many ways. And I think also it's the idea that this has become now safe, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. Yeah, right. Well, that, that that's part of it is uh, the, because of the nature of her. Yeah, she looks like, you know, a cutesy, archy kind of thing, you know, but it's... Uh, but it's nasty, you know? Well, yeah, I could clean it up and make it, you know, R-rated and, uh, be, but then it wouldn't be cherry anymore, would it? It'd just be more of that shit. But, but I also think that, that, that the, so, so I'll, I'll give a quick example. The word sexy when I was in third grade <laughs> was a very, you know, edgy word. You know, okay. it, 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 if you said the word hell, it was edgy. Now yeah, I'm okay. 29, oh, yeah. so, you can imagine me seven, eight years old saying hell, you know, 21 years ago. Now, fast forward, you know, my my friends have a sister who is significantly younger. And when she was in third, fourth, fifth grade, the word sexy was just in their vocabulary. It had no meaning. The word became watered down. And so I think that's what somewhat happened with Cherry. But I still think it has that edgy element to it where everybody knows now where I think society has risen a little bit closer to it and that's what i think's happened because that's what's happened with a lot of media a lot of other things where words where the word fuck doesn't really have the same meaning as you know it did 10 years ago or 15 years ago right oh yeah no i was a lot like i keep thinking uh, uh i mean it used to be when i was a kid uh, uh saying goddamn was totally taboo and when it said, and why even damn before you remember when Gone with the Wind came out and he said, I don't give a damn. And that was, like, oh, oh, taboo, that, that little thing goes up the back of your spine, you know? It's like, but now it's when you hear the word nigger, oh, oh my God, somebody actually said that, Look, that exactly that, when you hear God damn. But then, and, and you know, and uh, yeah. And you know who the first person that said God damn in a, uh, in a movie was? It's Elizabeth Taylor. Crazy. <laughs> uh, just, anyway, just... yeah, that's uh, but yeah, that's uh, and now it's that you know what is all oh, what, but that's but it's just a word. What is, is the word intrinsically bad, evil? You know? yeah. But yeah, but it was you know, goddamn was uh, it was totally taboo. It's 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 a very very interesting thing, and I think that that cherry is still. It, it very much edgy and I think society can rise a little bit closer to it. But I think it's, it's very, very fascinating when, you know, obviously now going 2022, you know, I think we've gotten closer to Cherry and what Cherry is, but I don't think that takes away. I just think people are more receptive and open to the idea of what it stands for and what it's trying to accomplish. And I also think that it's beyond culturally significant because it has opened up doors for what can be done. You know, one of my favorite books is Bang Tango. That's basically dealing with a transsexual who's playing the mob, her ex-boyfriend, and a variety of other people so that she could have her freedom. And it's a crazy book. And that book could not have been made without underground comics. And right. coming out of it, and because that book, and that book can't be made today either. It was made, I think, in the 90s or early 2000s. And it's, it's a very cool book. And it's just one of those things where I just feel that, you know, underground paved the way. So I am curious what, what is, 
And so I think I touched a little bit on what's next for Cherry and obviously the graphic novels all coming out and everything in that nature. And I think I think that there's at least three or four more chapters in you for a bunch of other cool projects. And I think, I think you know what you're doing. I just think you don't want to tell us. That, that's what I really think. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> I, I think that's what it is. An hour and 15 minutes in, you're just like, I'm not telling you anymore. <laughs> right. you know, all my artists, you're going to basically go through you know, all my artists. You're going to book them for covers. They're, they're, they're going to be mine first, and then they're going to end up with me for life. And, yep. and you know, that, that's what's going to happen. I am definitely going to be trying to get an interview out of Mocha Fufu because she is an amazing artist. Um, and I, hopefully, luckily, this is at the end of the interview and not at the front of the interview. This way, people actually have to watch the entire thing to learn how to steal my playbook. Um, but obviously, I do want to give you a chance to promote this action figure, Cherry, everything else that's coming out with it and where can people find you support you actually back the kickstarter because it doesn't mean something and it goes a long way when you go and back kickstarters and pick up things because you can't do it without anybody so where can people you know go support all this and support you and actually pick up your work and buy your stuff well oh uh well we, we got a, a website uh, jerry comics with an x.com and uh, we can, and yeah, and that's where we sell all our stuff. And then obviously the Kickstarter is up above, so go check that out. I'm going to be pushing out this Kickstarter heavy into my group, mm -hmm. my yeah, audience. I appreciate that. Okay. So definitely going to be pushing this out and all that stuff. Um, and seriously, I mean, go back this Kickstarter. It's cool. Um, I can't make any guarantees that you'll make money off of this action figure slash art. But if you're into action figures, you collect them, you're into sort of cool pieces, interesting things, you know, this is definitely up your alley. And there's a lot of choice where you could spend 70 or $80 all the way up to like 300 on certain pieces. So obviously, you know, there's something for everybody and there's all sorts of price ranges. Um, but I will say this, that things are selling out relatively quickly. So you yeah. keep that in mind that if you like something, um, you know, you should pick it up. I have a feeling that if you're looking just for the four basic set, that that's not going to be selling out because that seems to be however many people order. That seems to be how many you're going to make and some extras. But the variant editions definitely are limited. So that's something that people should keep in mind. Um, also, I'm going to promote myself. Obviously, please use Mixum. You get 5% off your order. If it's a good discount, you know, you're producing a comic book goes a long way. Every percentage point counts. Um, when I back Kickstarters and I'm ordering your books, I like them to be bagged and boarded, please. And I like my books to arrive perfectly. And the way you ensure that is bubble wrap and bags and boards. And bags and boards are expensive, everybody. Last time I checked, a pack of boards is $16 and bags are like $14. That is $30 for 100 So use my code POPANIMECOMICS to get 10% off. So that's $3 you save. And if you're shipping out 500 or 1,000 or 3,000 comics, you know, bags and boards get expensive. So please use my code because I do get an affiliate link and it does support this show. Um, also, my Kickstarter is up and happening. Um, so if you want to guest on my show or want to show me love or you want to buy a super cool $500 tier, I appreciate all sorts of money being thrown my way. Um, but more importantly, um, any amount helps because it helps keep this show up and running. Um, but more importantly, if you're going to back a Kickstarter, you should back Larry Welch's Kickstarter with the action figure first. And then you should back my Kickstarter right after because we both need support and you should be backing both. And I don't care if you throw me a dollar. You know, if you throw me a dollar, I will be happy. You throw me three bucks, I'll be even happier. So please go do that. And um, I'm going to give you the final word. Um, okay, uh, I'm really gratified and uh, grateful, and uh, this is uh, this is great. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on. Well, thank you for coming on. I mean, you're a legend, so you've been doing this forever. So, so, so I should really be thanking you because okay, literally, <laughs> I mean, you're you're a legend in the industry, and you've done so much for so many things, 
and 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 and, and just 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 uh, I know I was gonna give you the final word, but but I'm taking that back now. Um, <laughs> just, just just to give you massive compliments while we're live, <clears throat> you've progressed freedom of speech in a lot of ways. You've progressed freedom of speech in comics. You are in a lot of freedom of speech comic ads. I'm sure the comic book legal defense fund loves you because you clearly have pushed the line, um, paved the path for so many people, showed that anything can be done with a comic. And I think that, that you've put a bunch of smiles on people's faces. And so okay. I think that's something that people really need to understand is that in, I don't know how many people stay in comics for 50 years. It's a very short list and you've done that and you haven't just done that. You've actually progressed the entire medium. And I think it's very important that people understand that we only dealt with a very, very small section of what you've done. And it is important that people realize that you're not, you know, you're making the industry better than when you entered it and you're leaving it better for the next generation. And I think that that's something that you should be complimented uh, for and rewarded for. And I think people really need to know that. So that's how we're going to wrap up. Unless you have anything else you'd like to say. Oh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. That that's, that's great. That's really, uh, yeah. Thanks. And that is a perfect note. And I believe that is a wrap. Okay.